Those who remain will open their Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 17. We'll find our text this morning, Ezekiel 17. A little over halfway through your Bible, not quite two-thirds, but somewhere in there. Jeremiah and Lamentations right before it. If you find those books of the Bible, you'll be very near as well. Ezekiel chapter 17. Please look with me down to verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, put forth a riddle, and speak a parable unto the house of Israel, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, A great eagle with great wings, long-winged, full of feathers, which had diverse colors, came unto Lebanon, Lebanon and took the highest branch of the cedar. He cropped off the top of his young twigs and carried it into a land of traffic. He set it in a city of merchants. He took also of the seed of the land and planted it in a fruitful field. He placed it by great waters and set it as a willow tree, and it grew, and became a spreading vine of low stature, whose branches turned toward him, and the roots thereof were under him. So it became a vine, and brought forth branches, and shot forth sprigs. There was also another great eagle with great wings and many feathers, and behold, this vine did bend her roots toward him, and shot forth her branches toward him, that he might water it by the furrows of her plantation. It was planted in a good soil by great waters, that it might bring forth branches, and that it might bear fruit, that it might be a goodly vine. <coughs> Say thou, Thus saith the Lord God, Here's the question, Shall I prosper? Shall he not pull, it up by, pull up the roots thereof, and cut off the fruit thereof, that it wither? It shall wither in all the leaves of her spring, even without great power or many people, to pluck it up by the roots thereof, Yea, behold, being planted, shall it prosper? Shall it not utterly wither when the east wind toucheth it? It shall wither in the furrows where it grew. We'll pray, Father, help us to understand, above all else, you, your hand, and your working. And God, as we look at kingdoms being set up and kingdoms falling, as we looked at individuals that uh, rise and individuals falling, God, I pray that you would help us in our hearts to be settled and reminded that, God, firstly, you are absolutely in control. You are a great God. Nothing escapes your, your eyes. Nothing escapes your wisdom. But, God, also, nothing escapes your hand of judgment. And so, Lord, as a response to who you are, I pray that you would help us to make good application of the Scripture here this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I've heard many times a parable being defined as an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, and that isn't a misdefinition of a parable. But Jesus explained to his disciples many times that he spoke to them in parables to conceal a meaning from individuals who were blind or unbelieving. And that is a more apt description of what a parable is. It is always interesting when Jesus would speak to the multitudes. Many times it would be Pharisees and scribes that would be surrounding him. They, of course, would have... Uh, being given way to by the multitudes, they would have come to the front of the crowd and they would have been the people at the forefront who would be asking questions. And really, in many ways, even though perhaps the crowd wouldn't have acknowledged that they would have represented everyone who came to Jesus. Many times they'd ask Jesus, they would come to Him asking questions. <coughs> the Bible would say tempting Him. In other words, trying to get Him to say something wrong so that they could take His response and condemn Him with it. They would try to provoke Him. And uh, sometimes when... Uh, they would come to Jesus and ask Him questions to tempt Him. Sometimes He would answer them directly. Sometimes He wouldn't answer them. And sometimes He would speak to them in parables. I really believe that the reason Jesus would speak in parables was because He wanted to teach those who wanted to hear a truth, but He wasn't concerned with instructing those who would take the truth. And his, the proverb is to cast pearls before swine or as, have it be as a jewel of gold in a swine's snout. Uh, in other words, Jesus would not waste truth and wisdom on an individual who had no heart to receive the truth, act on it, and believe it. I want to say this morning that the Word of God is as much of a parable to a person who won't live it 
as, as any parable that Jesus spoke. It's amazing what a waste truth is on those who aren't concerned with hearing it. But when Jesus would finish, when He would dispense with speaking to the multitudes, He oftentimes would be alone with His disciples or followers, not just the apostles, but oftentimes followers or disciples. And they would say, Jesus, we don't understand what You said. We don't get it. And so we know that a parable hid truth not only from unbelievers, but it hid truth from believers. And then Jesus would explain what the parable meant. Here, Ezekiel is given a parable, and along with it, God gives... God is merciful enough to give the meaning of the parable to Ezekiel as well. The picture here is one that you know, certainly in the day would have been very meaningful. An eagle would have been as majestic of a, of a being as any being there, there is. And an eagle would certainly have been very representative of kingly or majestic. It would have been a majestic uh, representation. And so the picture here is that on the... Uh, on the, the, the mountains or hills of Lebanon, an eagle goes and plucks off a twig and takes it into a populated place in a marketplace, and literally it you know, is, is used for trade. And the cedars would have been of immense value. Cedars are still beautiful today and have a lot of value today, actually. But also, cedars in that time would have been a large part of a, of a palace or a luxurious place. And, uh, you know, the craftsmen of the day weren't so ignorant as many of us think. Cedar's a large product in a lot of, quote, green building today because of a lot of qualities that it has. And so it would have been very timely, very resistant to bugs, as well as uh, something that would have done well with moisture and, and so forth. But it had a lot of value. Then also the picture was to take a seed from a vine of the land and take the seed and to plant it in another land, and to plant it in such a, a way that the eagle plants the vine, and of course the eagle's a picture here of a king, to plant the vine, the, the vine takes root, it's planted by the waters, and it grows low branches. A vine dresser always would try to keep the fruit on, uh, down on the low branches, obviously because it's the simplest way to harvest it, also because of damage that could happen to fruit if it were up high and if it were to fall and so forth. So. It, it has low-hanging fruit, the vine does, and uh, it grows toward the eagle. In other words, it seems as though the eagle is uh, being blessed or is, the vine is deliberately uh, producing for the eagle. Then we see a second one happening. And then after this picture of an eagle planting a vine, the vine uh, coming toward him and, and uh, growing for it and, and uh, being productive, then the question is, shall it prosper? Well, evidently so. Maybe you're just going to look on the face of the question and ask the question, is it going to prosper? The answer is evidently it's planted by water. It's well planted. It's evidently a good quality, healthy vine. And yes, it's going to be extremely productive. But the answer here is, shall he not pull up the roots thereof and cut off the fruit thereof that it wither? God said, is, am I not going to take and pull it up and is it not going to wither? And the answer is, yea, verse 10, Behold, being planted, shall it prosper, shall it not other with, utterly wither when the east wind toucheth it? It shall wither in the furrows where it grew. Now God here gives an explanation <coughs> of the parable. So Ezekiel said, this is the parable that I had. Can you imagine being given a two-part message from God? In other words, God tells you about the eagle, about the vine, asks the question, shall it prosper? And the answer would have, should have been, you'd think, yes, and then God's saying, no, it'll wither. And then God leaves. That's the end of the message. Well, here's the second part. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Say now to the rebellious house, I'm in verse 12, Know ye not what these things mean? And if I'm the audience, I say, Uh-uh, <laughs> I don't have a clue. I have no idea what it means. Tell them, Behold, the king of Babylon has come to Jerusalem, and have taken the king thereof and the princes thereof, and led them with him to Babylon, and hath taken of the king's seed, and made a covenant with him, and hath taken an oath of him. He hath also taken the mighty of the land. Now to fully understand this, you and I need to go back to uh, two prophecies in the scripture, back past Lamentations, back to Jeremiah, and uh, specifically uh, chapter 52 would be a place to go. Jeremiah chapter 51 is addressing ultimately the destruction and judgment of Babylon, who is used in the, uh, uh, in the disbursement and destruction of Jerusalem. 
And one of the things that's taught in Jeremiah 50 and 51 is that God uses even other nations that do not follow, do not know God. God oftentimes will use the wicked in judgment of the righteous. Many times God will take a person who doesn't necessarily know God, but perhaps fears God more than those who are called by His name fear Him. You know, it is entirely possible and quite probable in many instances that individuals who do not even know the graciousness of God in the person of Jesus Christ for their salvation. In other words, they've never been born again and really understood what it was to be a recipient of the love of God. You know, when the, the first time you really comprehend that you're not just a speck, a spot, or a number, but that you are a person and a name to God Almighty, and that when Jesus gave His life's blood on the cross, He had you in mind individually, and God cares about you as a person. I'll just tell you something, that's overwhelming to me. When I realize what I am, dead in my trespasses and sins, but that Jesus Christ in due time gave Himself for the ungodly, myself, and God's will for me is that I would come to Him in repentance, receive Christ as my Savior, and have eternal life in heaven, heaven as my home, Jesus Christ as my dearest, closest friend, and all the things that pertain to life and godliness. I'll just tell you something. I'm overwhelmed with the goodness of God. It's just, I mean, it's just like I just think about it. I just think all of this is such a contrast with what I deserve. I'm so undeserving, and yet God is so good and so gracious. And then I just think about the fact that, that I've been privileged to hear and that God has been good enough in many instances to have me here more than once and to not just offer me the gift of salvation, but literally to compel me to be saved. I'm telling you, my friend, God not only wants you to be saved, but He sends His Holy Spirit after you and gives you life circumstances that literally bring you to a place where you have to be confronted with the goodness of God in the person of Jesus Christ. And I'm just overwhelmed. I just think, man, God is so good. But sometimes individuals who ought to know that, and they have received Jesus as their Savior, seem to have less of an awareness that there's a God in heaven who should be served, loved, and feared than those who have received Him as their Savior. I honestly, and, and, and I, 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 I have to be careful in saying this, because we know that for a person who is unregenerate, who is born again, that their righteousness is as filthy rags to God. In other words, good works of a person who won't receive Jesus as their Savior are not impressive to God. They are actually done in a way that says, God, I don't need Jesus because I'm good. And so that's the ultimate rebellion, to reject the love and the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary is the ultimate in rejecting God. It's the ultimate sin. It's the most wicked heart attitude there could be. But there are those individuals who perhaps do not have the privileges of knowing God and having His blessing. And, and in the economy in which we're talking about, this is not the church age. This is Israel. And these are individuals who as a nation are called to be a special part of God's economy as a people. And yet... Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, for the most part, and even when he was lifted up in pride, had more of an awareness and more of a concern about God and who God was than the people who were so richly blessed by God. My friend, you and I sometimes are so frightened that God is not going to bless us that we forget that there are times and circumstances in our lives when perhaps it would be better if He did not. You know, we really are at a crossroads in our country today where if individuals believe that financial prosperity is more important than godliness in our nation, and we're not a, a nation's not saved as a whole, but uh, listen, America certainly is not Sodom. You know, God told Abraham if he found one righteous, if he found ten righteous men in Sodom, that he would spare the city. And that wasn't just Sodom, it was Sodom and Gomorrah, that was the area around Sodom, the, the whole surrounding area. He said, if I find ten righteous men, I'll spare the place. I hear people talk about, where are the modern day Sodom? Well, the people who are acting in those ways are. But my friend, there are more than ten righteous men in the city of Fort Lauderdale. And so for people to say, well, God is not going to 
uh, spare us and that sort of thing. But friend, what does concern me is that individuals who are recipients of the gospel, they're saved, they're born again, they're more concerned today with success, financial prosperity, and safety than they are with just being godly. And when we come to that position when individuals are more concerned with comfort than they are with being right before God, I think in His mercy many times it's time for God to allow them to have some discomfort. It would be fine for us to lose a great deal with regard to freedom, privileges, and uh, the things that we value and hold so dearly as, quote, Americans, if God were to bring us to a place where we recognize our need for Him and the importance of godliness over success, over wealth, I should say. This is a good description of Israel. They're just a people that want things to not be what God wants them to be. They want them to be what they want to be. Now, in verse... Well, let's read this. Verse, 50, verse 1 of chapter 52 in Jeremiah. We see this played out in actuality. Zedekiah was 1 and 20 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hamatol, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord according to, to all that Jehoiakim had done. Now Jehoiakim was Jehoiakim's son and uh, he only reigned for a little while and was killed. He, he revolted against the king of Babylon. He was killed. And Zedekiah would have been Jehoiakim's um, father's brother. He would have been his uncle and he reigned in his stead. So it would have gone back instead of from the passed down to the firstborn son because the, the son of the king, the firstborn son, had passed the kingdom down to his son, then he had been killed, didn't have a successor, went back to the brother of the king. There you follow that, Zedekiah? That's who Zedekiah is. And uh, let me ask you a question. Who is it that allowed Judah to be carried away captive into Babylon? Who allowed that? God, God did. Well, everybody actually did because no one could do anything to stop it. <laughs> you could say everyone did. But... In Israel, there were sort of two parties. Uh, there was Egypt came into a place of uh, being threatened, and uh, by by the growth of the Assyrian uh, Empire, and, and that would have been the ones who ultimately uh, took all the way up through Syria and, and became uh, Nebuchadnezzar conquered through Babylon. And uh, Egypt saw this growth, this encroachment into their territory, and so they wanted to push back and fight. And, and Pharaoh had strong armies. And the king of Judah thought, well, it would be in our best interest to unite with the Egyptian army and try to push them back. And that was how uh, Je Jehoiakim met his de demise, was pushing back against Babylon, trying to help Egypt to not become a vassal state or a tributary of, uh, of Babylon. Well, Egypt still maintained its independence. But in Israel, there were two parties. There was the Egypt will help us party or the we'll just be tributaries to Babylon party. But God had an opinion about it. God told, the, told Judah particularly, He said, you, what I want you to do, Nebuchadnezzar is going to come with his armies, and what I want you to do is I want you to go into captivity. And the reason for your captivity is because you have not kept the feast, you have not, uh, you are not, you have not uh, paid your tithes, you have not uh, you've, you've worshipped idols and the captivity is a res, as a result of your unfaithfulness to me. And so I want you just to go into captivity and at the end of seven years, I'll let you come out of captivity. But in Jerusalem, there were two factions. There was a group that said, no way. We would be better off to pay tribute to Egypt than to go into Babylon to captivity. So Babylon came, laid siege, uh, took, took them into captivity and Zedekiah actually was allowed to remain as king there in Judah. And it was a pretty, pretty agreeable circumstance, actually. I mean, he wasn't a free man in the sense that he, that he uh, answered to no one and paid tribute to no one. But Nebuchadnezzar was rather benevolent toward him as an opposing king. When a king conquered a territory to allow another king to remain and reign and to rule over his people was often seen as threatening. And the first thing that you would do when you conquered a territory normally was to just destroy them. But, but Nebuchadnezzar was a different sort of king. 
Zedekiah had a promise to Nebuchadnezzar. His promise was, we won't revolt against you, we won't rebel against you. But, the, but he united himself with individuals that wanted to uh, get together with Pharaoh Hophra from Egypt and uh, try to win their independence. The only problem with winning their independence from Babylon was that God didn't want it. I want us to pause here for a moment, Christian. I want us to understand something. So many times you and I treat circumstances in life the way that Paul treated his thorn in the flesh when he prayed three times for the Lord to remove it. We treat it as though because we don't want it, God doesn't want it. And I want to say to us this morning that we ought to be more concerned with knowing what God wants in our life than wanting to have what we don't want removed. I'll be the first to tell you this morning that sometimes what God wants isn't always what would be easiest for me. Sometimes what God wants isn't always what I would choose if I got to choose the, the, the simplest road, the simplest path, and the happy little way of life. But I know for certain that what God wants in my life is always the best for me. And so do you. So do you. You know, there are times I believe in our lives if we're just honest about it, if we'll just stop and we'll hear the still, small voice and we'll hear the Holy Spirit of God quietly telling something that we'll recognize, you know what, this is what God wants. All the time while our emotions and our thoughts are shrieking, this is the last thing I want, and yet we know this is what God wants. And so many times, our response to what God wants is a response of overt rebellion. And we essentially say, I do not care what you want, God. I don't care what you want. I care what I want. And I'm not concerned with obedience. I had rather die than live the life you want me to live. And God is left with dealing with a rebel. And that's exactly the circumstance of Zedekiah here in Isaiah in Jeremiah 52. The Bible says in verse 2, He did that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. For through the anger of the Lord, verse 3, it came to pass in Jerusalem and Judah, till he had cast him out from his presence, that Zedekiah rebel, rebelled against the king of Babylon. If you read down in verse 5, the Bible says, So the city was besieged under the 11th year of King Zedekiah, and uh, verse 7, then the city was broken up, and all the men of war fled and went forth out of the city by night by the way of the gate between the two walls, which was by the king's garden. Now the Chaldeans were by the city round about, and they went by the way of the plain. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued after the king and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. Then they took the king and carried him up unto the king of Babylon to Riblah in the land of Hamath, where he gave judgment upon him. So they, there are these men of war that have, that have uh, been besieged around the city. There's a famine. Ultimately, the, the walls are breached. The Chaldeans are coming in. And the men of war escape around the plain. And the Chaldeans let the men of war just escape because they recognize, they recognize that the problem isn't what the men are doing. The problem is what the men are led to do. And the problem for Nebuchadnezzar is that he was promised by Zedekiah that, they, that he would just be a quiet, peaceable king and he wouldn't rebel. He'd given his word. And if you read through Jeremiah, you see that God gave by the voice of the prophet Jeremiah that this is what I want for you. This, and if you'll just quietly be what you're supposed to be for the time period, then later on I'll deliver you at my hand, not at your hand. And Zedekiah said, you know, it's unacceptable. I'm not going to live and be known as the king that lived under bondage. I'm going to win the independence for Judah. And so he fought a war God never wanted him to fight. And so Nebuchadnezzar is, is absolutely astonishing in his wisdom. And really in the way that he responded to what God wanted, he allowed the men to escape, but he captured Zedekiah, or he had Zedekiah captured, brought back, and now here's what happened. The king of Babylon, verse 10, slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. He slew also all the princes of Judah and Riblah. So that's where they were carried away to. Then in verse 11, the Bible says, And he put out the eyes of Zedekiah, and the king of Babylon bound him in chains, and carried him to Babylon, and put him in prison until the day of his death. 
Now later on, uh, you see some of the treatment of Zedekiah, and actually, he was Nebuchadnezzar was actually pretty pretty kind to Zedekiah, even though he rebelled against him. But the last thing Zedekiah saw was his children being killed before his eyes, and then his eyes were put out, so that'd be his last memory. And he asked the question, "Who wanted that?" You see, I believe Nebuchadnezzar, or Nebuchadnezzar was obedient to what God wanted. But friend, the question to who wanted it was nobody but Zedekiah. Yes, ma'am. So, um, in Ezekiel, is the eagle Nebuchadnezzar? I mean, in the parable? It, it's God. It's, it's God and uh, <coughs> ultimately setting up and taking down. But, but, the, uh, but the, the vine is the kingdom. The vines are the kingdoms. But yes, I mean, it could be representative of both, of two things, but ultimately the eagle is, a, is an ultimate representative of God who sets up and takes down kingdoms and tears it out. Because you see the pronoun him being used, and it's used as the eagle. Who's going to tear it, tear it out? Uh, shall it prosper? Shall he not pull up the roots thereof? And that, the precedent for that is the eagle. So who's pulling up the roots? Well, Nebuchadnezzar may be the claws and the talons, but who is calling... Who is calling the shots with Nebuchadnezzar? God ultimately is. When Nebuchadnezzar uh, was lifted up in pride, as we see the example in Daniel, and actually rebelled against God, uh, God humbled him. But he also was humbled. Some individuals cannot be humbled, and that was Zedekiah. Some individuals can't say, I, I won't live like this. I refuse to, to deal with these circumstances. I will not cope with this. That was Zedekiah. Nebuchadnezzar was made like a beast of the field. And he said, wow, <laughs> boy, I sure lifted myself up. Now I'm nothing but an animal. And God said, okay, Nebuchadnezzar, now you know who God is. And Nebuchadnezzar worshiped God, turned to God. And that's the exact analogy of what we're looking at. Here's an individual who is not, sparta, part, spark, not part of a special promise. He isn't part of a covenant that God has between Babylon and uh, himself. And yet the people of promise are less concerned with being what God wants them to be than a man who is just willing to be an instrument of God even for judgment. I've asked myself the question many times, would I like to be Nebuchadnezzar? And I wouldn't. I would never want to be used as a judge of God's people. But I'll just tell you something, I'd rather be Nebuchadnezzar than just about any of his contemporaries that were called by God's name. He's a man at least was what God wanted him to be. You say, well, it's really easy when you're lifted up in a, in a high place. Well, he was taken down in his pride. You know, my friend, you can be in a place of prominence and still uh, be has, have a humility and a, and a regard of reverence for God and who He is. So now, let's look at our two conclusions. In verse, uh, verse 13, we see, speaking of the king of Babylon. He hath taken of the king's seed and made a covenant with him and had taken an oath with him. He hath also taken the mighty of the land that the kingdom might be based that it might not lift itself up but that by keeping of his covenant it might stand. The only way for Israel to be preserved was for Israel to stop rebelling. And I'm not just talking about rebelling against God. I'm talking about rebelling against Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar literally had, because God allowed it, had the ability to wipe them out. That was not his mantra. Nebuchadnezzar was a very different ruler. I believe the Roman Empire was built on much of the philosophy of, of the conquest of Nebuchadnezzar. When Nebuchadnezzar would conquer a territory, the thing that he saw as the greatest danger was nationalism. In other words, if a group of people were loyal to the place where they were, uh, then they would want to fight for their homes and their land and so forth. So what Nebuchadnezzar would do, would he, be, he would take enough of a majority out that a nationalistic uprising would be out of the question. So he would take the best of the people, and he'd take them to Babylon, but he didn't take them to Babylon and just make them slaves and servants. He oftentimes took them to Babylon or to other provinces of Babylon and put them in comfortable positions, gave them good jobs with good positions, and, and uh, treated them well, uh, took good care of them, and allowed them to be part of, part of his empire. And so here they are in another place and they're thinking, you know what, I should go home and fight for the homeland. And they're thinking, you know what, the non-homeland's nicer. <laughs> the position where I'm at is better. I'll be killed if I go there, but you know what, I've been treated fairly and God said I'm supposed to be here. And so I'll live out life where I'm at. 
You know, Christian, you and I can live where God wants us to be. Sometimes we're so stuck, so narrowly minded about something that isn't eternally consequential that we can miss the benefits of just being where God wants us to be, doing what God wants us to do. That was Zedekiah. All right, so let's, let's finish this out. In verse 19, we see the conclusion. Because of Zedekiah's rebellion, therefore thus saith the Lord God, I'm back in Ezekiel 17 in case I neglected to mention that. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, as I live, surely mine oath that he hath despised, and my covenant that he hath broken, even it will I recompense upon his own head, and I will spread my net upon him, and he shall be taken in my snare, and I'll bring him to Babylon, and will plead with him there for his trespass, that he has trespassed against me. Sometimes we think we're fighting men, and we're fighting God. It wasn't as though Zedekiah was clueless about this. God had given his messenger, the prophet, the message about rebellion. And God said, don't fight it. And Zedekiah fought it. So there's not some, you know, Zedekiah is just doing what he knew to do. No, he's doing what God told him not to do. And God said, it isn't Babylon, it isn't Nebuchadnezzar that's doing this to you, Zedekiah. It will be me. I'll be the one doing it. And in verse 21, all his fugitives with all his bands shall fall by the sword, and they that remain shall be scattered toward all the winds. And ye shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it. Now let me just say this. When it's all said and done, you're going to have to say, well, you know what? God's bigger than I am. That's essentially what he's saying. You're going to know, God said, you're going to know that I said to do it. It's interesting here that if you had given a pop test, a quiz, to Zedekiah and to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar would have passed the test. I know it's really ringing right now. Nebuchadnezzar could have passed a test saying, whose hand is working? Who's bringing? Zedekiah would have said, it's Nebuchadnezzar doing it. But he knew it was God. And Nebuchadnezzar, who God hadn't given a special prophecy to, would have said, well, you know what? It's God. The same circumstances looked at by individuals with different amounts of revelation. The person with the most revelation was the farthest from having a clue about who was working and who was in control. Zedekiah. And the person who should have had the least re revelation was the person who was the most in tune and the most understanding about who was in control. And that's Nebuchadnezzar, and that is that God is in control. Now, Christian, I asked you a question. Where do you and I fit into the hand of God working? Where do you and I fit? Very often times, you and I have a political opinion, we have a spiritual opinion, we have a personal opinion about everything before we ever consult what God's opinion is. And we just think that because I want this, this must be what God wants. And my friend, what you and I need to find out is what God wants and want that. Zedekiah could have had a comfortable living and his son certainly would have lasted longer. Had he been concerned about what God wanted, but he said, I don't want what God wants. It's not good. My friend, God is always good. And even in judgment, even in chastisement, God is good because the chastisement shows us in our reckoning that we are sons. Zedekiah was a son. Of, he, was, he was a child. He was, he was an, an heir of the kingdom. And the promises to those individuals that Christ would come and be born of his seed. And yet in his rebellion, he rejected God. Okay, so here's the promise. There's first a promise of judgment, but here is the promise of goodness. We see all this and we just see a hand of God that I think sometimes is an inaccurate representation of God. My friend, let me ask you a question in God's heart. Does God delight to judge? No, He doesn't at all. Does God delight to take us from a place where we, where we are comfortable and we're at ease and things are pleasant? Does He delight to take us from that place and to, to make us low? And the answer to that is, no, God actually delights to take us from low places and put us into high places. That's God's heart. Let's see it here in verse 22 through 24 and we'll be finished. Thus saith the Lord God, I will also take of the highest branch of the high cedar and will say, I will crop off from the top of his young twigs a tender one, and I will plant it upon a high mountain and eminent. In the mountain of the height of Israel will I plant it, and it shall bring forth boughs and bear fruit and be a goodly cedar, and under it shall dwell all fowl of every wing, and the shadow of the branches thereof shall they dwell, 
And all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree, have exalted the low tree, have dried up the green tree, and have made the dry tree to flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. The contrast here is a tree or a twig that is flourishing because of God's goodness, but has come to a place where it says, I'm flourishing because of the water. I'm flourishing because of my location. I'm flourishing because of who I am. And God said, you know what? You need to be taken down. And then you have a tree in a low place and in a dry place. And God takes it and puts it in that high place and in the, in the, in the place with water. And God grows it and God nourishes it. And God says, all I'd like is for you to acknowledge that I put you here. You say, Pastor, God's all about Himself. No, my friend, God's all about being acknowledged for who He is. See, for sometimes you and I, we look at God as though He's simply a human trying to lift Himself up. We look at Him as though He's a peer who wants to lord it over us. My friend, He's not a peer, He's Lord. He's not simply an individual who is trying to have His way versus everyone else's way. He's an individual who created every person in the ability to have a will. So many times you and I take what God has given us and not even understanding that we and even the wicked belong to God and are reserved for God. And we try to make our lives all about ourselves. You know, sometimes I think we find the same traits, the same characteristics in the lives of those who even know God. We think that I'm living for my pleasure, for my purpose, and I'm not concerned with God's pleasure and God's purpose. And my friend... If you're in that place, God loves you enough to bring you down. God loves you enough to bring you down. And the question this morning would be this. The circumstances for Zedekiah are obviously very different than the circumstances for anyone in this place. And yet the God of Zedekiah remains the same God. He's a God who had a comfortable life for Zedekiah, albeit not the one Zedekiah chose, but a good life. He had a promise for him of redemption. He had a promise for using him. And, but it wasn't the promise Zedekiah desired. I don't know about you, but many times we're unwilling to be what, where, and who God wants us to be. My question for you this morning is this. What if God says no? Are you an individual that has set yourself in a high place that God is going to be obligated for your good to bring you down? Or are you a person who is simply willing to be whatever God wants you to be and you're willing for God to take you up? But this morning as we were looking at maximizing or getting the max out of our lives and uh, really uh, looking at James, one of the things we saw was that the brother of low degree is to rejoice when he's exalted but the rich and that he's made low. You know the best thing in the world is to know my friend that God knows you that He's concerned with your life and your living. And that wherever, whatever the place that you remain in, that the hairs of your head are numbered. And I have no jokes here. The hairs of your head are numbered. And that literally not a sparrow falls in a field or a lily dies without God being aware of it. God loves you. He's concerned with your life. And He wants you to have His best. But His best is what He knows to be best, not what you necessarily desire without knowing Him. The question this morning is, have you given that to God? you ever taken a time in your life when you've said, you know something, God? Whatever you want is what I want. God, if you want me to be here, that's where I'll be. You know, I've many times witnessed Christians literally fighting God and God puts them in a circumstance or a situation and they try to battle to get out of it. My friend, first, that's futile. Secondly, it's not your purpose. And you'll never be satisfied outside your purpose. You'll never be satisfied outside what God wants in your life. So many times we're willing just to battle and to fight. And the only place that that's going to be is that you're going to be lifted up into pride and then God's going to show you who He is. My friend, you can be lifted up as high as you want. You will wither in the presence of God. Father, I pray that you would help us to understand this truth. Lord, as much as there's an analogy, a parable for Israel, there's truth about our God. And God, the beauty here is that there's a promise for those individuals that simply are willing to be what you want, that you'll lift them up. God, could, 
We ask this morning that your Holy Spirit would just convict us and show us enough truth that we could be brought to a place that it would be true of us that we are the ones who perhaps are not even in a high place but are willing to be just whatever you want us to be. And that, Lord, we could see that hand of blessing that comes as a result of our contrition and our proper attitude towards you. We thank you for what you've taught us now. We pray that you'll instruct it by your Spirit now and make it a permanent part of our thinking. We pray in Jesus' name.